All right, everybody. All right, guys, welcome into another episode. Oh. <laughs> Go for it, man. Yeah, welcome into another episode of the Queen City Soccer Show. I am Cole Godfrey, and I'm joined as always by Level Up Luke. Luke, we have a special guest on today. Uh, how you feeling, man? You feeling good? There's not a lot going on in the Charlotte community right now. Yeah, man, we're doing a little jersey swap here with the Cincy Soccer Talk guys, and uh, Jeff Tibbetts is joining us. So I just had the pleasure of appearing on on their podcast, and uh, now he's agreed to return the favor. So Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was uh, good to to have like thirty minute little recording with Luke uh, on our side. We we run our our Monday night uh, live podcasts uh, with the crew, and then. You know, we have these two little splinter uh, podcasts that we run. One is with Coach Brad Goff, who goes into sort of like analyzing the games that we just uh, participated in. And then Jersey Swap, which is the one that I host. And we basically will talk with as many podcasters uh, for the team that we're facing and sort of get their perspective on how their season's going, how they expect the game to go, just to sort of pick their brain a little bit before we actually see 90 minutes of action. Fantastic. Um, hey, Cole, uh, I know you you have a relationship with these guys. You've been on the show uh, in the past, and, and now I get yeah. to join that little club. So it should be pretty yeah. fun, man. And um, I think you were – I think you might have been with me at Hopfly uh, when Cincinnati came to town here in Charlotte, and we met some of the uh, Cincinnati supporters. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think you were there with me, but uh, I, was, I was telling Jeff on, on, the, on their pod – it was great, man. Like the Cincinnati yeah. fans really, you know, represented themselves well in their club. And we had a great time uh, hanging out. We actually did a little short video segment with one of their supporter groups uh, for our YouTube and, and TikTok channels. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I'm excited. I would love to get up to Cincinnati and return the favor and uh, tailgate up there with those guys. But um, not to be this weekend. So that'll have to be next season. Yeah, no, I've uh, I, I did I was with you at Hot Fly, and I, what was the name of the supporters group? Noda. No, is it like a Norcus or something? Noda. The Norden, yeah. Norden, yeah, Norden. 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 That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. they're they're so, they're and, one and of got, uh, yeah, they got they got um, uh, they're one of the sort of like the four main groups, I guess you can call in uh, here. We have Dean Instad, which is like the German for the inter the inner city. We have the Pride, who's probably the biggest supporter group. Um, we've got the Brigade, um, and then we've got the Norden, um, who sort of represent the northern parts of, of Cincinnati. Okay, yeah, they were they were they were kind enough to uh, chat with us and let us do a couple of uh, of social media uh, videos with them, and they were they were great. Like Luke was saying, like Luke was saying, they were great. They were uh, fantastic to host them, and I, I agree with Luke one hundred percent. I'd like to get up there and uh, watch a game up there for sure. So tell us, what can we expect going into this game on Saturday, Jeff? Uh, what What is the atmosphere going to be like? And, you know, what is that home support looking like for Cincinnati this season? It was certainly better than it was a week ago this time. Um, I, I think, I mean, we had the short week where we um, had to go down to D.C. And we, I don't think we really looked our best in D.C., even though we came out with a 3-2 victory on the road. Um, you could tell that uh, some of our defense was sort of still trying to get on to uh, you know, all cylinders with injuries to uh, Matt Miazga and Nick Haglin really leaving our defensive line in, in pieces. Um, but uh, then, boy, 6-1 against Inter-Miami. It doesn't matter if it's with Messi, without Messi, with Suarez, without Suarez. A win against Inter-Miami in this formation. We're feeling pretty good. We're, we're going into this game with a lot more um, uh, motivation, a lot more confidence on our side. Gotcha. Yeah, and and we can we can attest to uh, we just faced Inter Miami at home ourselves and uh, without Messi and Suarez and got beat and so you know we can attest that it's it's no small feat that definitely in the in the emphatic fashion that y'all y'all put it to them so uh, I, and not only that I mean I'm sure y'all talked about it on your your pod uh, Jeff but we're coming out there we're coming up there without our starting striker who is who got a red card in the last match against Inter Miami. So we're we're gonna have a tough time specifically in the attack against you guys. Yeah. Well, there. I mean, there's a few things uh, looking at that. I mean, one, you're you're we're not exactly the behemoths on at at home that we used to be. I mean, last season we did pretty well uh, for our home record. Uh, this season it 
we've lost a, some pretty bad games at home. I mean, two one loss to the Revolution. We lost to Red Bull when they came in. We had a few bad zero zero draws to start the season at home. So it's it's no slam dunk. Six uh, one victory against Inter Miami or not, uh, but also. You know, um, I think we've gone into games such as the one against DC where we thought, um, you know, we had uh, the, the opponents on the ropes. They didn't have much in terms of uh, bodies on the bench, but uh, they still pressed us for 90 minutes and, and really made us work for that win. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so tell us, like, looking at the game on Saturday, um, you have a couple of key pieces, some players that are out with injuries that, that may be coming back from injuries. Uh, what is, what does that report look like for you guys and availability on Saturday? Um, well, I mean, I, the two names that I had mentioned, Matt Miazga, uh, defender of the year for MLS last season, he's out, uh, for the rest of the year because of a PCL injury. Uh, his knee took a bad beating, uh, at San Jose a few weeks ago. Um, and then, uh, once you know we we had that first punch to the gut and then we we got a, a haymaker to the face uh nick hagland who uh has sort of been our guy off the bench for uh the d-line he ended up breaking his fibula so he's out for Ooh. the rest of the season um so whatever you do please do not aim for miles robinson's knees uh he really <laughs> needs them for the the olympics um, the only other name that I can really think of that might not, uh, well, definitely won't be there, uh, our center uh, midfielder, Obi Nuobodo. Um, He got a yellow card and he is officially out on a yellow card accumulation suspension. Um, the good news is, is that uh, he got a red card a few weeks, a few games ago and uh, the game afterwards, we still look pretty good. So uh, we're not too, too worried about our, our, our depth at the moment. Um, I think the only other name is uh, Malik Pinto, who uh, suffered a little bit of an injury with the FCC two squad, so he wouldn't be available either. But other than that, I think we're rocking a pretty healthy squad. Gotcha. And um, as far as what we need to look at, I think you know we're kind of keying in on on the big matchup here being the Cincinnati offense versus the Charlotte defense, and you know our listeners know all about. Charlotte's back line. Uh, we just signed Adilson Milanda to a contract extension today. Andrew Privet got one earlier in the season. Yuri Yaronin, the Finnish international. And then Nathan Byrne, who has reinvented himself this season as, you know, I call him like a demon back there. The dude's got so much fire and passion. I, I wish I had, I wish I could bottle it up and, and sell that. I'd become a, you know, millionaire overnight. Um, Kalina, the, the nine clean sheets, man. Um, the clean sheets. So that's um, that's our defense, and that's really what is going to make or break the Charlotte FC effort. Tell me, like the Cincinnati attack, what are you guys bringing to the table to to try to break us down on the defensive side? It's going to depend on really how confident Pat Noonan is with rolling out the same formation that he rolled out against Inter Miami. Um, the season we sort of started out with sort of a three-five-two formation, where you know we we rolled with with the offense up there, Corey Baird and Aaron Bupenza started up there. Um, but they really didn't, I think, display any sort of cohesiveness with the rest of the, the squad. So that's where you were seeing the zero, zero draws. And so I think what Pat Noonan is starting to experiment, experiment with and quite successfully is the use of uh, Luca Orishano, who uh, we have on loan from uh, South America, um, he's sort of taken the spot that Alvaro Barrial uh, had taken, which was the left wing back position. But over time, we've been using him more on the right as an inverted winger. And against Miami, he was probably one of the best players on the pitch. Um, a bunch of uh, assists in that game. He's showing that he can play much more of a triple threat up there. It, it doesn't really matter who the the main striker is whether it's uh, Kevin Kelsey, who we also picked up on loan, uh, Yu Yakubo, who's been um, uh, sort of a, a revelation for us, uh, or of course Lucho Acosta. But um, it's it, they've been experimenting with like a three prong attack, and in this case, it just happens that two of the the prongs of that attack are midfielders that are doing quite well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'll uh, hop in and. 
I'll say, I, I think a big key for Charlotte is Ashley Westwood and whoever Dean ends up starting back there in the, in the center defensive midfield role uh, in front of that back line. Um, I mean, we had we had pretty good success against you guys when you came down uh, earlier this season, uh, finished one-to-one, and um, honestly, not a lot of people were expecting us to win that game, me included. I was not expecting us to win that game at all. Uh, but it's it's different when you're playing – when specifically for this Charlotte team, when they're playing at home versus when they're playing away, uh, they're coming off of two two losses in a row, um, and again coming up there without a starting striker, and it's it's going to be interesting to see. Um, Carol Swiderski obviously is back with the team, but not going to be available for this match, and Scott Arfield is now gone; is going to a Bolton. So I'm very intrigued to see again what y'all's attack does against our defense, but is. Where do you see an advantage, if any, uh, getting forward for Charlotte against Cincinnati's defense? Uh, In in terms of how to attack our defense, is that what you're saying here? I mean, really, you're looking at Miles Robinson, um, sort of our, uh, obviously, our our defender of the current season, um, uh, playing sort of the, the, the keystone in the middle. Uh, usually that's Matt Miazga's role, but you know he's also very uh, adept into sliding there and and sort of helping out uh, Ian Murphy on his left and uh, probably in all likelihood either Kip Keller or uh, Alvis Powell uh, on his right. Alvis is not a, a traditional center back, so um, if anything, that might be the location that you try to attack. Um, but you also have on that side, DeAndre Edlin, who we picked up from Miami and he's shown a lot of flashes of speed and he's able to both, I think, bolster that defensive attack, a de- de- defensive, um, shield, I should say, and turn around the offensive attack when necessary. So, uh, I'd say whoever's on the right, you probably have to attack that, but that also means, um, having to get through, um, the, the surrounding pieces that, uh, are able to. I think pick up any sort of uh, stray attacks that come through. Yeah. Yeah. sounds good. And, you know, mentioning miles Robinson earlier, uh, I'm, I'm from Syracuse, New York. I love me some miles Robinson. Uh, you know, he was a orange man and, and now to see him represent the U S national team, he's definitely, I think my favorite U S national team player. I was really hoping Charlotte could have gotten him in the off season, but uh, I think he found a pretty good home with you guys there. So, um, yeah, that'll be huge. And he's playing with you guys for the next two games before going off to the, the Olympics. Yeah, he's going to be uh, at this game. Uh, he'll be available for the midweek game against Chicago at home. And then he's off to the Olympics. Uh, we really could use him, I think, uh, at that away game at Red Bull. But, um, you know, beggars can't be choosers right now. Um, I think what's important is we just want to see him succeed uh, in a, uh, an opportunity that he really wasn't given in uh, Copa America. You know, he was called into the U S team there and didn't see a lick of, uh, uh, time on the, on the pitch, uh, which we felt both was a shame and a travesty. Yeah. Um, so to see him, I think succeeding and getting that opportunity that he wasn't given, um, as a youngster, I think, uh, we're, we're hoping that he can bring back something memorable and substantial. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and we've covered some of the U.S. Uh, national team uh, discussions. And obviously today is is a, a very good day for U.S. soccer fans with the news uh, yesterday that Burhalter was out. And then today the rumors flying that, you know, Jurgen Klopp was approached. And, uh, oh, man, that smarmy press conference from Chirendolo that I just saw on my uh, timeline. Good Lord. But, uh, you know. Anything's got to be better, one would imagine, than Burhalter. So, uh, I think Miles Robinson might get some more some more action for the national team in the near future. There, there were there have been people that are sort of like, "What about Pat Noonan? What about look what he's done with Cincinnati? What about Pat?" Yeah. And we're we're like, "Dude, no, no, it's <laughs> nay on the the, the at, at pay Noonan a." You know, it's uh, we 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 really feel that Noonan um, has been uh, sort of a, an amazing artist at work. When, when he's uh, coaching this team. He, he seems to be putting together the right pieces at the right time and has a great rapport with Chris Albright, uh, the guy who's really making all the big decisions in the front office. So to have the two of them working together, it feels like it would be a shame if we were to lose one of those, especially after both have been given extensions. 
Um, but then you've also got all of these available pieces as assistant coaches. I mean, I can see Kenny Arena, uh, Bruce Arena's uh, son, doing something with the U.S. team in the future. I mean, we've got Dom Kinnear, who has um, been one of the unspoken leaders uh, on the coaching staff. Um, we, we've even got some really good um, uh, goalkeeping uh, uh, coach, uh, coaching staff as well. This is a team that I don't want to see break up anytime soon in the coaching staff, but it seems inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, and I I, I just kind of want to ask, I mean, so I'm assuming that you're a United States men's national team fan. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, okay. So, you know, would Pat Noonan, I mean, you, you would know more about him than anybody else that we're talking about. Would he be a good fit for United States men's national team uh, head coaching job as far as, how, how they play in the talent pool that they do have, do you think he could could step in and, and find success or, or better, more success than Burhalter was finding? And, you know, selfishly, I know as a Cincinnati fan, you don't want to see him go. But as a men's national team fan, you should want what's best for the men's national team, man. I mean, I don't know. I, I think he's, he's good for being able to massage egos. I mean, um, you know, you've got Lucho Acosta, who is a talented – uh, MVP candidate year in, year out, he could definitely win the MVP this year again. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from Pat Noonan keeping egos in check, letting the, the, the players who dictate things on the pitch to have free roam. I don't know how well he would do for um, the likes of Pulisic, the likes of uh, Gio Reyna. I, I don't know how he would do for massaging those egos. Um, that being said, I would rather, and I... I would rather throw out uh, Jim Curtin as a name. I mean, I think uh, you look at Jim Curtin and he's the guy that's sort of fed all of these talented coaches that are coming in to uh, be successful in, the M- in MLS. I would like to see if Jim Curtin can do something with what he's been able to do at Philadelphia, especially with all of the, the youngsters that have come through. I think he would do a much better job at taking all of the um, the academy players, all of the under... Uh, 18 under 20 players who are are ready to make the next move to the U S team and give them their opportunities. I don't know. I I really don't know with Pat, what's uh, his play would be for, for a U.S. team. Yeah. And I mean, I think I kind of agree with you as far as the curtain part, because not only that, but I mean, you have Philadelphia is not having a very good season this year. And uh, with that going, um, we had Jose on uh, when we played the union a few weeks ago and, you know, I asked him if, if Kurt was on the hot seat, and he pretty much said, no, he's not on the hot seat. And, you know, but at the same time, if the U.S. comes calling, which I, I do want to kind of, you know, we've been very critical of Matt Crocker on this show specifically. Um, but you know what? Going At least reaching out to Jurgen Klopp shows that they are – they're swinging for the fences. So, you know, with that type of uh, – with that type of gall to go after somebody like that, you know, I, I have – I'm I'm very hopeful, which I have not been in the past couple of weeks. So, but getting back to uh, Cincinnati and Charlotte, uh, you know, how, how do you see this game transpiring on Saturday? Do you, you know, do you see more of uh, a Cincinnati domination like they did against Inter Miami, or are you expecting a, a closer game? I'm I'm expecting a closer game because I look at Miami's defense, I look at Charlotte's defense, and I see a Charlotte team that is much more prepared for uh, offensive attacks down the middle. Um, I, I see a Charlotte team that is um, uh, miles better than what they had uh, on the pitch last season. Um, so I find it will be difficult to penetrate through. Then again, we've got the reigning MVP, and he's shown in the past week that he can cut through uh, any sort of defense like Swiss cheese. So um, I, I still, still favor FCC in this uh, situation. I don't see a 6-1 victory because I think um, it's just too strong of a defense to break through. But I do see a crooked number, at least, uh, for FC Cincinnati. I think they're going to score two goals. I'm going to call it a 2-1 FCC victory. I got That's fair. And Cole, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think uh, – I put a poll out on Twitter earlier today um, just, you know, getting the Charlotte listeners and the listeners of the show and supporters getting their opinion as far as – what they were expecting and the overwhelming majority were expecting a draw. Um, just, and I think a lot of that has to do with just, they're, they're looking at it through a biased lens. 
if I'm if I take the uh, the the Carolina color, I look at this. You know, going up there without your starting striker, your leading goal scorer for Charlotte, who has not been score as a team has not been putting their chances away and has haunted them in every loss this season. Is just they're getting plenty of good chances, and Coach Smith is has reiterated this time and time again that we're they're getting in those positions. They're just not finishing, and when you have your leading goal scorer not there. I have a tough time seeing Charlotte getting a goal, maybe one. But, again, like you said, with, with the reigning MVP, and I, I, I personally think that Charlotte probably going to – would would lose two to one, two to nil, something like that. Something like that. Definitely being up in Cincinnati. If it was in Charlotte again, I, I, with that caveat, I think it's anybody's ball game. But being up there, I, I, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a tough match. If Charlotte do come out with a draw, it's going to feel like a draw that feels like a win. Yeah, and I'll double down. I, I think we're on the same page here. Um, the, I, I think that out of this road trip, this hell is real road trip with Cincinnati and Columbus back to back, if we can come away with some points, I'm happy, man. If we get two or three points, that would be a, a success in my book. I don't think it's coming on Saturday. So I think best case scenario, nil nil. We park the bus and we just make it a you know a mud fight out there. And if we can do that, then you know, I could see us taking a point, but in terms of my prediction, I think it's going to be one nil, two nil Cincinnati. Um, I don't know where we're scoring from aside from free kicks uh, or set pieces. So yeah, I just, too many question marks on offense, but I can't see Cincinnati scoring more than two goals tops. So that automatically puts us in the conversation. You know, there's always a chance when you stop the other team from scoring. So uh, I'm not without hope, but as a betting man, you know, uh, give me the the Cincinnati uh, minus 0.5 all day. I do sure. think that um, both of our teams are going to be missing some vital players. I mean, Patrick Ajemang for you guys, uh, he's got out because of a red card suspension. Uh, we're missing Obi Nwobodo, our our midfielder, because of yellow card suspension. So there are going to be some holes that I think both teams can find um, if they look and, and stay diligent. Yeah, I mean, storylines yeah. to watch, uh, you know, key players out. You have the Olympic matchup with uh, Miles Robinson and Lee Labada. Uh, this is right before the transfer window opens. So I'm assuming you guys are hearing some rumors, just like we're seeing the news fly fast and furious over on this side. So it, it's definitely an exciting time. And I'm looking forward to the game on Saturday. Any final thoughts, gentlemen? Uh, yeah, I mean, I. You know, again, I, I hope that Charlotte can come up there and at least come out with a draw. I, I'm not hopeful, but uh, Jeff, I really appreciate you coming back on the show, man. We, we always appreciate you and, you know, your coverage of FCC. You do a phenomenal job. Cincy Soccer Talk does a phenomenal job for our listeners. If you have any questions or if you're looking to learn more about Cincinnati, Cincy Soccer Talk is the place to go. And uh, Jeff is a, is a great person to, uh, to hit up as, as far as that as well. And uh, Jeff, can you tell our listeners where they can find you guys? Yeah, um, my name is hard to spell, so I would just uh, refer you to our uh, our own Cincy Soccer Talk account on either X or uh, over in Instagram, or you can go to CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com, our website. We uh, write up quite a bit. We've got some very talented and uh, knowledgeable guys uh, in, in our group. Um, uh, Coach Brad Goff, who does all of our analysis, um, our live show on, on Monday nights uh, on both YouTube and the recording uh, the next day. Yeah, we, we try to give everybody sort of uh, the aspect of, of what it's like to be a Cincinnati fan after three long years of Dust Bowl soccer. So, <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hey, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and we will catch you uh, next time, man. Thanks a lot. I can't wait to see the, uh, uh, hopefully I see the, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.